It is an honor to be your pastor, your teacher out all over the world. I want to thank you for coming to the website, each and every message, and listening to them, making comments on them, and those of you that make contributions to help keep us going because I need your help. I want to thank all of you to begin with for that. We're going to study about unworthy rulers. Unworthy rulers tonight. Unworthy rulers. There are so many people that are not worthy of being rulers. And we're going to go and see an example, a what we might call a premier example of this in the Old Testament. In the book of Kings, 1 Kings, the 22nd chapter, we're going to talk about a man here that uh, was definitely an unworthy ruler. Riches sometimes just destroy people. Riches can destroy you. You think more of yourself than you are. I've known some wealthy people that were really arrogant, selfish people. And we have an example of this in the Bible. During the Old Testament times, the ivory was a rare and expensive item found only in the palaces of kings and homes of very wealthy people. Ornate ivory carvings were inlaid in furniture in the wooden paneling used in elegant houses. They would use cedar and then inlay it with gold and silver and ivory. A mark of wealth King Solomon reigned for 40 years between 971 and 931 BC. His royal throne was made of ivory, according to 2 Kings 9 and verse 17. And Solomon started out as a very humble young man. And God asked him what kind of gift is like the Aladdin lamp that you rub, and, and a genie pops out and says, What do you want? And he, God asked him what he wanted. What kind of gift could God give him? And Solomon said humbly, I need wisdom to rule your people. And he did. And then as he became more and more wealthy, he began to use and put heavy taxes on his people, God's people. He married many women. Finally, his life was carried away with women, wine, alcohol, and drugs. And wisdom, he wanted to learn everything under the sun, and he tried to do that. He was a very wise man. But a very affluent, wealthy, rich, extravagant, selfish person. And it destroyed the whole kingdom of Israel. Now David, his father, loved God. Solomon loved women. David loved God. Solomon loved women. He had at least a thousand and one wives. thousand one, including the Queen of Sheba, or Hail Selassie and, and what they call the black Jews in Ethiopia. After Solomon's reign, the king of Israel, was, or the land of Israel, was divided into Israel and Judah. There were two different kings. The wealth, there was a great difference between the wealthy and the common man. 
kind of like our CEOs today getting a thousand times more than the working man. I think that's too much. I think there's too far a difference between a CEO and a working man. The wealthy, when we had the stock market crash several years ago in 9-11 and the, the stock market just crashed, companies went bankrupt in America, banks folded up, and the CEOs were the ones that caused it and yet the government bailed them out. They took off with their big pensions sometimes. Corruption. America has been plagued with corruption for a long time. Other countries in the world are plagued with the same thing. Riches and power and affluence and pride and control over the masses. This is a story that we're going to tell you tonight. Corrupt unworthy rulers. The prophet Amos condemned people for their excesses and their affluence, for exploiting the poor and predicting that those who rested upon beds of ivory, in other words beds that were uh, had inlaid with ivory and gold, would be judged by God, Amos 6 and 4. King Ahab of Israel reigned between 874 and 853 B.C., basically about 21 years, was an avid builder who loved to display his wealth with ornate buildings and elegant furnishings. And if you go out in the neighborhood where we used to live out there in the, in the Old River area, you will see absolute displays of extreme wealth. Palaces, marble floors and walls and staircases, ornate yards, swimming pools and lakes in the yards. There are some out there built by the mafia and some built by other extravagant people. They want, when you go by their home, they want you to see their wealth. And that's the way Ahab was. That's the way Solomon was. Ornate buildings and elegant furniture. He completely adorned the capital city of Samaria, and I have been there. Which is Father Omri reigned in 850 or 880 to 874, about six years. And begun several years before excavations of the royal palace in Samaria have yielded evidence of extravagant practice that Amos had condemned so many millennia ago. The outside of Ahab's ivory palace in 1 Kings 22 and 39 and Amos 3.15 was faced with white stone which gave the appearance of ivory, his ivory palace. It was decorated throughout with the numerous ivory carvings and inlaid ivory panels. The two-story palace was constructed on a high hill surrounded by numerous courtyards. And one of the courtyards featured a large pool. Excavators believe that this pool is where they washed Ahab's blood from the chariot. And we're going to see that story after he was killed in battle. Discovered nearby, that was a large storehouse with many hundreds of panels of ivory. He was in love with ivory. Ivory is white, people. Kind of a Yahweh white. But white stands for righteousness. Ahab was one of the most unrighteous kings of Israel. He had a wife. Now Ahab means like uncle or father and uh, his wife Jezebel. 
Jezebel means where is the prince or where is Baal? Baal, the prophets of Baal. Where is Baal? Where is the prince? Where is the king? Where is our master? One time, a man by the name of Naboth, he took Naboth's vineyard from him. King Ahab talked to Naboth and he said, I'd like to buy your vineyard. He said, I can't sell my vineyard. It is given to me. It's a family heirloom and I'm supposed to pass this down to my children because that's one of the laws of God. Naboth went home bawling and squalling and his wicked wife came upon him. And why are you crying, Ahab? He won't sell me the vineyard, she says. I can get it for nothing. Just leave it to me. And she accused with false witnesses Naboth of cursing God. And he was stoned. And he had Naboth's vineyard. Naboth's vineyard cost Naboth his life. And Naboth's vineyard will cost Jezebel her life and will call Ahab his life. Naboth was a righteous man. Now the word Naboth means fruit, but it also means to prophesy. Nabu in the Hebrew. It came about in the third year that Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, came down to the king of Israel. 22 and verse 2. Now the king of Israel said to his servants, Do you know that Ramoth Galilee belongs to us? And if we shall do nothing to take it out of the hand of the king of Aram. And he said to Jehoshaphat, Will you go with me to battle at Ramoth Galeed? And Jehoshaphat said to the Ahab, the king of Israel, I am as you are, my people are your people, and my horses are your horses. Moreover, Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, Please inquire first for the word of the Lord. There's a smarter man right there. Now, Jehoshaphat means uh, the Lord has judged. Jehovah has judged. Please inquire first for the word of the Lord. Inquire of God. Now, the first place that Ahab goes is to his false prophets. Then the king of Israel gathered the prophets together, about 400 men, and said to them, Shall I go against Ramoth Galilee to battle, and shall I or shall I refrain? And they said, Go up, for the Lord will give it into the hand of the king. But Jehovah said, said, Is there not yet a prophet of God, of Jehovah, here, that we may inquire of him? Let's forget the false prophets, Ahab. Let's go to the man. Let's go to the one man of God. And the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, There is yet one man whom we may acquire of the Lord, and I hate him, because he does not prophesy good concerning me, but evil he is Micah, Micaiah, the son of Imrah. But Jehovah said, Let not the king say no. Then the king of Israel called an officer and said, Bring quickly Micaiah, the son of Imrah. Now the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, were sitting each on his throne, arrayed in their robes, at the threshing floor, at the entrance of the gate of Samaria. By the way, inside the gate of Samaria, that's where the court was taken, was uh, carried on. The courts were carried on inside the gate of the cities. And all the prophets were prophesying before them. These are all false prophets now. Then Zedekiah the son of Chenal made horns of iron for himself and said, that Thus said the Lord, with these you shall gore the Armenians until they are consumed. And all the prophets were prophesying, thus saying, Go up to Megilly, Ramath Gilead, and prosper, for the Lord will give it into your hand of the king. Then the messenger who went to Samaria to, to want to summon Micaiah said to him, saying, Behold, now the words of the prophets are informally favorable to the king. Please let your word be like the word of one of them, and speak favorably. And Micaiah said, As the Lord lives, uh, what the Lord says to me, that will I speak. 
When he came to the king, the king said to him, Micaiah, shall we go to Ramath Gilead to battle, and shall we refrain? And he said to him, Go up and succeed, and the Lord will give it into the hands of the king. He didn't say what king. Then the king said to him, How many times must I adjure you to speak to me nothing but the truth in the name of Jehovah? And he said to him, I saw all Israel scattered on the mountains, like sheep who have no shepherd. And the Lord said, These have no master, these have no Baal. Let each one of them return to his house in peace. Then the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, Did I not tell you that he would not prophesy good concerning me, but evil? And Micaiah said, Therefore, hear the word of the Lord. And I saw the Lord sitting on his throne, and all the host of heaven standing by him on his right hand and on his left. And the Lord said, Who will entice Ahab to go up and fall upon Ramath Gilead? And he said, this one to another that said, Then a spirit came forth and stood before the Lord and said, I will go and entice him. And the Lord said to him, How? And he said, I will go out and be a deceiving spirit in the mouth of all of his prophets. And then he said, You are in today's sin and also prevail. Go and do as you've been told. Now therefore, behold, the Lord put a deceiving spirit in the mouth of all of these your prophets. And the Lord has proclaimed disaster against you. Then Zedekiah, the son of Contenna, came near and struck Micah on his face. And he said, How did the Spirit of the Lord pass from me to you? And Micah said, Behold, you shall see it on that day when you enter into your bathroom by yourself. The inner room was his bathroom. That's his restroom, his private room. And the king of Israel said, Take Micaiah and return him to Ammon, the governor of the city, and Joash, the king of king's son, and said, Thus saith the king, Put this man in prison. Feed him sparingly with bread and water until I return safely. And Micah said, If you indeed return safely the Lord has not spoken by me and he said listen to all you people listen to all you people so the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat the king of Judah went up against Ramath Gilead and the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat I will disguise myself and go into the battle but you put on your robes so that the king of Israel disguised himself and went into battle. That's Ahab. Now the king of Amram had commanded the 32 captains of his chariots, saying, Do not fight with small or great, but with the king of Israel alone. Go after Ahab, get him. Get that man. And God put it in his heart to do that also. So it came about when the captains of the chariots saw Jehoshaphat that they said, Surely it is the king of Israel. And they returned. They turned aside to fight against him, and Jehoshaphat cried out. Then it happened when the captains of the chariots saw that it was not the king of Israel, that they turned back from pursuing him. Now a certain man drew his bow at a random, just, just put an arrow in his bow and pulled it back and shot it into the sky. A certain man drew his bow at random and struck the king of Israel in the joint of the armor. So that he said to the driver of his chariot, Turn around and take me out of the fight, for I am deadly wounded. I have a deadly wound. And the battle raged that day, and the king was propped up in his chariot in the front of the Armenians and died at evening. And the blood from the wound ran into the bottom of the chariot. Then a cry passed throughout the army, close to the sunset, saying, Every man to his own city, and every man to his own country. So the king Ahab died and was brought to Samaria. And they buried the king in, and they buried the king in Samaria, and they washed the chariot by the pool of Samaria, and the 
dogs licked up, licked up his blood. Now the harlots bathed themselves there, according to the word of the Lord which he spake. Ahab died a painful death. He was a unfaithful, unworthy ruler. Ahab squatted on the throne of Israel like a toad on a toadstool. He was a wicked man with wicked <coughs> appetites, a wealthy man that tried to feed all of his appetites. He killed Naboth for his vineyard because he liked it. You know, when you when you go through life, sometimes you see people like this. Too many people like this we find in the world today. I'm going to tell you something, people. We live in a time that it's not going to really matter whether you're rich or poor. Right now, just getting food, getting toilet paper is a real problem. Getting tissue paper, buying milk, ketchup, the necessities of life, milk, eggs, is a real problem. I don't care how much money you've got in this world, you can starve to death. I don't know, people are just absolutely beating the, guns, the gun stores doors down, buying everything they can buy. They say they're buying guns and ammo to protect themselves. The American people have less freedom right today than they've had in a hundred years. We're supposed to stay home. We're supposed to isolate ourselves. We're not supposed to leave our homes except to buy the necessities of the life or go to the doctor, and the doctors are telling us not to come to visit them. My wife has a very serious heart condition. She needs to have her either a pacemaker or shocked or ablation, and they won't even see her. All the money in the world cannot buy your life. The doctors are terrified. The world has changed. 90% of the businesses in America are shut down. They're non-essential. They voted this last few days that the gun stores in Los Angeles were a necessary item, so they opened them back up. Because the people had to have arms and ammunition to protect themselves and protect what they have. I saw a little joke the other day. A man took all of his guns out of his gun safe and threw them on his bed and took the toilet paper and the ketchup and the milk and the eggs and put in his gun safe. Has it come to this? The world is upside down. But I'm going to tell you something. God's got the world's attention right now. You can't go to church. Was there ever a time that you thought that, that you couldn't go to church? You can't go to church now. We're having church right here. But I can't invite anybody here now. That's what you do. You invite people to come to church. But I can't do that. We have a very small congregation. But this message goes all over the world. God is on the throne, people. He's still on the throne. I think during this period of time, I believe many people are going to be saved. I believe. Atheists may not be atheists anymore. You know what? An atheist can't go to church and get saved, can't go to church and believe. The only place you can go to church is on the Internet. Unworthy rulers. 
have been a curse to the world. There have been some rulers in the world that there are nations where they work, live, rule. Sometimes they take them and put them on a balance and weigh their weight in gold and give it to them every year because they think they're worthy. We have unworthy and worthy rulers in this land of ours. On both sides, it's been from the right and the left. We have those people. Did they have your interests at heart or did they have God's interests at heart? They're supposed to be up there, you know, the representatives are supposed to represent the people that they elected them. And the senators are the senior members and they do what they think is right. Well, and we have vice president, president, speaker of the house, we have all of these Secretary of War, Secretary of Defense. And yet, we live in a world that it's not so much war now, it's the war is survival. Mm -hmm. And you hope that those over you in authority are righteous rulers and that are worthy. We have one king and one master, and that is God of heaven. All things will come to be one of these days. All of us have hard times with people because people lie, they cheat, they steal. They have to answer for all of that. Maybe they won't answer now. There are the white collar thieves and the blue collar thieves and the gutter snipe thieves. But they're all thieves. Whether they're in the White House or House of Representatives or the Senate, they're all the same. The thieves are thieves. And the few good are worthy of great honor. Our Father, we send this message out. You know, you've only got one way of salvation, that's looking to Jesus as our Savior, as the one that gave his life for us on the cross of Calvary, the one that died for us and was buried and rose again for our justification. Father, I pray that you bring those convict people now, use this time, let the world know what you're doing. You're testing mankind. The test of man. What are you made out of? What are you? Testing men. Father, I pray that you use this message to honor and glorify you. In Jesus' name we pray.